in here tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name, in Yeshua's name, amen. Wow, that's worship too, isn't it? Pat, you do such a beautiful job on the piano. Thank you again for, for letting us come here. This is so beautiful. We come expecting this year. We come expecting miracles and healings and signs and wonders. And last night was just absolutely phenomenal. Uh, people got healed here. People got delivered here last night. Keep in mind, if you got healed last night, and you believed it, you received it, you already had the healing, for God, died, Christ died on a cross for you, for those healings. You received it last night. If you received it, that means you have it. Satan will come at you, and he's gonna try to throw something right back at you again, and, and maybe give you the, the feelings again, or maybe give you the uh, symptoms again. But you keep saying, no, I am healed of the Lord. It is done, it was done 2,000 years ago when he died on that cross, it was done then and it's settled for those of you that were healed last night. It, some of you, it, may it was instantaneous. Some of it may take a few weeks, maybe even a year. Sometimes it's a doctor that's taking care of you. God uses doctors. He put them here for us too. So we thank you so much for last night. Uh, how many are new tonight? Oh, we got a good, good. Well, this is wonderful. Well, last night, uh, I talked a little bit about some healings that we've had here in the past uh, when we were here uh, back in 07 and 06 and 05. Um, and I was telling you last night a little bit about this one uh, little uh, girl that had a twisted like intestines in her. In her and she was, uh, they said that she was going to uh, die. She was very young. And she was healed. Her mother sat in for her. And we prayed over with her mom, and she was healed. I, I gave you a couple, a couple other examples of the healings that particular night, but there was one that I forgot. It was on the uh, email that they sent because of the healings. They sent this email, and I, this, this, only God. It says, one more testimony, Ken. My wife... And I was at a beach in Tel Aviv the other day with my children and three of the Spanish people uh, that we work with. The boy drowned, this boy drowned and was dead on the beach. My wife said in Hebrew, in the name of Jesus, live. And as soon as she said that, the air started going into his lungs. Then he died again. Turning blue, she shouted, Live in the name of Jesus. Live in the name of Jesus. And all the water shot out of his lungs. And she, and, and she said it was more than one time. She kept heaving and heaving. And the boy got up, walked away, and started playing on the beach. <laughs> Praise God. They recognize the power that you, you have, the power that you have. If you have Christ in you, you have the power and the authority to claim healing, not only on yourself, but you have power uh, to claim it on a friend or a relative or a family member. There was, I have to tell you one more story, and maybe uh, it'll, uh, this point is very, very clear. Um, Several years back, a pastor called me and he says, Ken, you got to come down with me to the Pittsburgh Hospital, the UPM Hospital. That's Pittsburgh University Hospital. He says, there's a girl down there from Grove City who was in a tragic uh, accident and uh, very, very bad head trauma. And so he says, I'll pick you up. He picked me up. We went down to the hospital and my wife went with me. And uh, we walked up into the room where she was at my wife, I says to go in one room and then go in the other room because they were a divorced family. So one family was over here, the other family was over here. I says, you minister to them and, and, and pray with them. We went in, I went into the uh, uh, room where she was uh, at and her mother and father were on both sides of the bed with her. And as I looked at her, and they said she only had about six hours left to live. And I looked at her and I says, Whoa, well, yeah, I, think, I think she's going to die. And now all of a sudden, it's, no, no. God says, I have the authority, we have the authority to claim deliverance and the healing for that young girl. 
The amazing thing was the two parents weren't speaking to one another. Of course, they were divorced. They were speaking tenderly, and we found out they weren't speaking, but they were speaking tenderly as I walked in to one another. And I says, and they weren't Christians. I says, but I want you to do something. I says, your daughter is going to be able to get up off this bed, and she is going to be healed. But I need you, and I looked, I says, you look me right in the eye. I says, do you believe that God can heal your daughter? And they looked at me and they says, yes, we do. And they were weeping and crying. And I looked at her and her head was probably swollen to about this big. She had two uh, tubes coming out of her head and blood was going out, both of them. Her body started swelling. We prayed over and I said, in the name of Jesus, I says, I speak the power and life of God into you. And I touched her top of her head. And I says, you will rise, you will rise in the name of Jesus. Well, I prayed it. I said, it's done. But she didn't move. So we left the hospital. My wife and I, there's a place uh, oh, about 10 miles away. We went shopping. And we got a call from the pastor who stayed. And he says, Ken, she opened her eyes. And she's blinking. And she's gurgling. I said, oh, praise God. Praise God. She is healed. Now, imagine an accident like this. One week later, she was home in Grove City. She lived right near the college there, sitting in the backyard, tossing a little ball with her brothers and sisters. Power of God to heal. It's there. It's yours. You have the authority to claim it and receive it. That's what happened last night. And remember again, as I said, if things don't feel like they're, you were healed, you say, no, I am healed of the Lord. If you believed it and received it last night, it's yours. Okay? Um, I did mention also yesterday that early on in our marriage, we've been married, it'll be 47 years this year. We were married a couple of years, and we had a, a real problem in our marriage. And uh, I won't go into all the details, but my wife had left. And I went into the bedroom after trying to commit suicide in the garage. I went into the bedroom, fell down, face down on the floor, got up, said, I don't know much about you, but I know what I need to do because I was told one other time what to do. So I asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart and fill me with his Holy Spirit. Forgive me for all my sins that I did. And I asked him to be Lord of my life. And I believe that he was the son of God or is the son of God. And he came for me. Now, our marriage for uh, about a year was rocky, but it was wonderful when, you, when we look back at it. We kind of laugh now. But I have a friend just lately who said that, and he, they've been married 46 years. He says they were having marital problems, and he told me that, he had, that both him and his wife went to counseling. So in counseling, he's telling me, my wife says, my husband... We've been married 46 years. He doesn't hug me anymore. He doesn't kiss me and love me anymore and, and, and snuggle. And she says, I don't know what to do. He says, the psychologist got up and took my wife and held her and bent her over and kissed her. And he let her up. And he says to my friend, your wife needs this three times a week. He says, all right, I'll have her here Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. What a good psychologist he is, huh? <laughs> I, I, I remember one time a kid was telling me about the psychologist telling him that this fellow came out of the, uh, his room and he had two, like, teepees on the top of his head out of, like, deer skin. And they were strapped to the top of his head. And uh, he says, he asked the doctor when he went in, what's wrong with that guy? He said, well, the fellow's just too tense. Uh. See, okay, good. That, that led me to say I'm done with those. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you. Last night we learned about faith. We learned about believing and how believing activates our faith. And when we're, our faith is, faith is activated, then it releases the anointing, and the anointing releases the supernatural power of God for your life and healing. Whether it be in marriage, whether it be relationship, whether it be finances, as we talked, uh, Aji talked last night. 
Faith, we also talked about a new definition of it. It's a supernatural substance of God. A supernatural substance. It's from God. And when we think that way, we start, and the church hasn't been doing this in the world. The church is, we talk about healings, and we pray about it, and so forth, but they're not talking about walking in the supernatural, because it's the supernatural that brings on the healings, because it is from God. And it says in uh, Hebrews 11.6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. He who seeks after him, what's it say? What? Must believe that he exists, right? And he is a rewarder, a rewarder of those who diligently seek after him. In Mark 22, Jesus said, I'm sorry, Mark 11, have faith in God. That's really the substance of our, our walk with faith. When Jesus said to his disciples after the fig tree had died, he says, have faith in God. It seems like so, things come at you all the time, especially if you're walking with the Lord. You, it says you're not going to be without tribulation. You're going to have tribulation in your life. But have faith faith in God. One girl in our Bible study says, yeah, I understand it. He says, but there's so many things that come in on you from the world. She says, you almost have to have those blinders on like horses have, and you just keep focused on the fact that have faith in God. There's a, uh, a fellow who was very, very uh, um, into his faith, was faithful to God, and even when we're not faithful, He's faithful. This fellow was driving up the coast of California in the United States. And a big cloud came over him, very faithful man of the Lord. And the cloud kind of opened up. He stopped his bike, and he heard the Lord say, You have been faithful. You have been faithful in everything. And because you've been faithful, I'm going to give you the desires of your heart. Because doesn't God say that, if I'm in you and you're in me and my word is in you, and how do you get the word in you? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So if the faith is in you, okay, the word is in you, he says, I'll give you the desires of your heart. He says, delight, delight in my word, and I'll give you the desires of your heart. Well, that's what this biker did. So the Lord says, because you've been so faithful, I will grant any wish that you would like to have. He thought for a minute, he says, I'd like to have a uh, highway from here to Hawaii. And uh, God says, well, that's really a, a, a big request. Not that I can't do it. But, you know, I have to put some posts. They're going to have to go down to the bottom of the ocean. And uh, it takes a lot of concrete. And it's probably 1,500 miles to Hawaii. He says, I thought maybe you'd ask for something more Something that, you know, I can't, I can do it, but I just thought you'd ask for something more like a personal around where you live in your home. He says, uh, no. He says, why don't you think of something else? He says, all right. He says, if I'll tell you what I'd like to have, but you have to be able to, let me explain it a little different. Um, he said, I'll give you that desire, but if you have something else, and he says, what is it? He says, well, could you help me understand women? He says, my wife. He says, I can't understand them. She said, they're, they're, so they're moody sometimes. All they ever want to do is shop. And they say, come with me. We're going to go shopping. They're uh, always uh, uh, more skeptical of things where I want to go forward. And all of a sudden, he heard the Lord say, well, do you want a two-lane or four-lane over to there? <laughs> I thought I would try one more time, but that's it. Okay. <laughs> Many times we walk like we're hanging on a cliff. And we look up, and uh, you've heard the story that a fellow was hanging on a cliff. And he heard a voice from heaven say, let go. He said, well, is there, uh, and, he's, and he's crying out to God, help me. 
and he's heard, let go. He says, is there anybody else up there? So he said, oh, I'm going to let go. So he either learned how to fly or he was going to get pulled back up. Okay, now, reason for that story. God is so faithful and so loving that he wants a relationship with us. And he went to almost the, the most supreme cost that anyone could ever go to is to give up his son for us. To save us, forgive us all our sins, to cover all our sins with his blood. And he's still there today. Whenever you need him, he is there. Last night we talked about, Aji talked about what you have in Christ. And I want to talk a little bit today before Aji comes on. I'm going to talk to you about positioning yourself for healing. And I don't know if, uh, could you put that? Yeah. In Mark 11:24 24, it says, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Now, that's in Mark 11:24. That's let's put this up right up at the top up here, but we want to have a basis for this prayer. Because when you pray, you pray that you receive it. But why do you do that? Well, one of the reasons is it says in uh, it's God's will for all of us to be healed. It is God's will for all to be healed. He did that in the he said this in the Bible, did it many times. He says in the song, uh, Pat played it, I think, last time we were here, I am the Lord that healeth thee, right? So if he is the Lord that healeth thee, he does not lie, that means he heals. Healed then, and heals now. There was a brazen serpent. How many remember the brazen serpent? You take a look. These, these people were bitten by snakes, and uh, the Lord told Moses to make a uh, brazen uh, stick with a, Brass, I think it was brass. Brazen. Is that brass? Bra <laughs> okay. A brazen brass. <laughs> uh, and he said, anyone who looks upon this will, will live. Nakushtan. Oh, thank you. Nakushtan. Okay. Okay. It says, when Moses, and this is in, in uh, <coughs> and when Moses lifted up, the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, and whosoever believes in him shall not perish. It was a foreshadow of what was to come. Jesus' words himself, if thou will, thou can make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, touched him, and said unto him, I will. Every time Jesus, somebody asked him, he healed him. Can anybody find a place in the Bible where Jesus says, I can't today, it's Tuesday, or I won't? Is there any time that he has ever done that? So that means whatever God says, he will do. So if he said he was going to heal you, and you have the authority to be healed, he's already provided it, you've got it. Then there's another thing. It says it's God's will that everyone be healed. And that helps us with that top part up here that says believe that you receive when you pray. Because God is a giver. God is a giver. God is a liberal giver. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all, there's that all, liberally and without reproach. And it will be given unto him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like the wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything for God. So what is he saying here? It is your faith. Is hard. That's, that's the thing that, uh, a better word maybe turns on, that's what pleases God. That's what pleases God. In, in 1 Timothy 6, 17, he says, God is a rich giver. Now this is because God is a giver now. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, 
nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. God is a giver. In Romans 8.32, God is a free giver. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? God is a giver. John 3.16, for God so loved the, that he finish it. Oh, that's great. That's funny. You ever, did you listen to that? Some are already done. The other ones are coming along. It's fun. It's like a race. All right. God is a giver. Also, a basis that all, uh, you know, that, that uh, God is, uh, he wants everyone healed. God is a giver. But then there's another rung in that little pyramid. God gives through the laying on of hands. In Luke 4.40, now, when the sun was setting, all they that had any sickness with diverse diseases brought them unto him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them all. Everywhere he was when he healed, he healed them all. Why did he heal them? Because they believed. They trusted. Also, God's a giver. Through the laying on of hands. In Mark 6, 5. And he could there do no mighty works, save he laid his hands upon a few sick folks and healed them. This is one of those, this is one of those points that people say, well, no, see, God does, or Jesus didn't heal everybody. But why didn't those people get healed? They didn't. The power was there, right? The power's here tonight. But there were people did not believe. Of course, they just said, well, that's, that's Jesus. He's a carpenter's son down there, you know. So God is a giver, laying on of hands. Also, God gives healing power to the sick. In Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Now, if you put those all together in the pyramid, it's God's will to heal all. God's a giver, a rich giver. God gives through the laying of hands, and God's healing power to the sick. Reach the top, and it says right up there. Therefore, I say to you, whatsoever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that you receive, and you will have them. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Aji now. But before I turn it over to him, we played a, uh, a video last night. Uh, it's a beautiful video. It's called The Father's Love Letter. So we got new people here. I, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. But we had several people come up and say, that was really good. Will you play it again tonight? And I says, yes, we will. So we're going to play it. You'll be able to, uh, you can go on his website, fathersloveletter.com, and download it yourself and make a DVD out of it. Uh, it's been downloaded uh, several million times. I, I, I thought it was around 2.5 million times I heard, but that was several years ago, so I'm not sure exactly how many. But it also, he, the American Track Society, that is their biggest track that they have, requested track. It's a, it's a fabulous, fabulous um, DVD. And the amazing thing is, it's all scripture. Every word he says in there is from scripture. And it tells the whole story, and he did it in one night. He got up, I think he said it was 1 o'clock at night. He says, I wrote to about 6, and he had a letter. Watch the, uh, watch the video.
He loves you. And He is the Father you have been looking for all your life. This is His love letter to you. desire to establish you with all my heart and all my soul, and I want to show you great and marvelous things. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Delight in me, and I will give you the desires of your heart, for it is I who gave you those desires. I am able to do more for you than you could possibly imagine, for I am your greatest encourager. I am also the Father who comforts you in all your troubles. When you are brokenhearted, I am close to you. As a shepherd carries a lamb, I have carried you close to my heart. One day, I will wipe away every tear from your eyes, and I'll take away all the pain you have suffered on this earth. I am your Father, and I love you even as I love my Son, Jesus. For in Jesus, my love for you is revealed. He is the exact representation of my being. He came to demonstrate that I am for you, not against you, and to tell you that I am not counting your sins. Jesus died so that you and I could be reconciled. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. I gave up everything I love that I might gain your love. If you receive the gift of my son Jesus, you receive me, and nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Come home and I'll throw the biggest party heaven has ever seen. I have always been father, and will always be father. My question is, will you be my child?
go on. I know you can go online to the American uh, Track Society. You can order those tracks. They're really beautiful. I think they're two dollars for like twenty of them. And they're just wonderful things to give out to people that because uh, I know you care about people coming to know the Lord, and it's a great, great tool. Aji, come up and bring the word. Okay, thank you, brother. Good evening. Brother Rick, I thank you again for inviting us to share and fellowship with you in this place. We are honored and we are highly privileged. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, I welcome you all tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's say a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you said we are two or more. I gather together in your name. You are there. So by the virtue of that word, you are here right now. We welcome you, Lord. We welcome you. We want you to take your place tonight in this place. Take your place in our lives. Take the throne of our lives and begin to reign. Reign, our free movement. Reign, 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 reign from the attic of our life to the basement of our lives. Take control of every room. Move by your spirit, move by your power. Let every evil be driven out in the mighty name of Yeshua, Amashia. We welcome you here, Lord. In Jesus' name we have prayed, so be it. Say welcome, Lord Jesus. Welcome. Yes, he is here. We have a dignitary in the house. And we welcome his presence. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. How many people are here tonight for the first time? Okay. So we have about maybe a third of the room that are new tonight. So it would behoove us to do a slight recap. Okay. Because uh, we begin talking about believers believe. Last night, believers believe. Okay. Because sometimes, you know, as a believer, we believe different things. And believing different things is not going to do a whole lot for you. You have to believe the right thing. And what's the right thing? You got to believe the word. Yesterday, I had you write out certain topics. Family, marriage, spouse, children. Parenting, finances. And I challenge you to write down as quickly as you can, what do you believe in each of those categories? Because right now in your life, whatever you believe right now, you are moving towards it in all of those categories. You are. Your belief system is the software of your life. It is what is driving you. It's like a magnet. It's pulling you. Your belief system is more powerful than any prayer. I could pray for you tonight and lay hands on your head until I rub off every hair on your head. <laughs> your belief system will override my prayer sooner or later. That is why you see people go to a revival they get healed, they return home, and the symptoms return. Because while they are revival, the anointing came upon them, and it broke the yoke. But they never changed the belief system. They never changed the belief structure. So all the symptoms returned. Until you clean the house and change your belief structure, you will never move to the next phase. Jesus Christ has redeemed us from every cause of the law. Jesus Christ has healed us. But you know what? Until you finally believe it in your heart, you will never enjoy those redemption privileges. That is the truth. Because the word says so. Let's go to Romans 1.17. Romans 1.17. Romans 1.17. And the part we are going to focus on tonight, we began yesterday, we'll continue tonight. 
The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. What is that verse saying? Put it another way. The just shall live by their belief system. They shall live by their code of their belief. What are you believing today? What are you believing? In every area of your life, what are you believing? Do you know what you believe Two to five years ago, you are the result of that today. You are living what you believed. Five years from now, if you tell me your belief, and if you don't change them, I could almost predict accurately where you will be five years from now. And I'm not, I'm not a prophet or anything like that. I just know that that is the way it works. What do you believe today about yourself, your life, your future, your marriage, your parenting, your finances, your employment, about your healing, to mention a few? You are a sum total of all your beliefs. And your life at any given time is moving in the direction of your dominant belief, for good or bad. Oftentimes as Christians, our belief system has been formed by life or experience, our parents, tradition, and culture. Do you know that? Do you know sometimes a teacher will say something to a little kid in school? They will say, you are no good in math. And if, if that kid believes it, he is ruled by that. He is sentenced. He is sentenced to prison for life. Do you know a parent, in, in anger, you could just say, you dumb idiot. That child is bound by that word if he believes it. Trapped, locked up in prison with the keys thrown away by that word. What has someone said to you? What has your parents said to you? What have you believed about you, about your race, about your sex, about your background, about whatever? Has someone made a racial slur at you and you have believed it? As a spouse or an ex-spouse said something about you and you have kept it in your heart and you believed? Someone once told Walt Disney, you know Walt Disney, don't you? The guy that created Mickey Mouse. A teacher once told him, you lack creativity. Was he wrong? But Walt Disney did not allow that to capture him. If he believed that, you will not have Disney World today. What has been locked up in your life? What dream has been, the enemy captured you with? Tonight we are going to break that chain. In the name of Yeshua. Because he's the only chain breaker I know. He's the one that releases the captive. Yes, he's good at it. Amen. So whatever you are bound by tonight, spells are going to be broken tonight. And you are going to be set free. And I speak by his authority. The just shall live by faith. If your faith, your belief system is not properly aligned with what is here, it is wrong. It is time to flush it. <laughs> Whatever it is, whatever it is, if it doesn't line up, that is why I ask you, and if you have not taken it seriously, I challenge you, this is our last night here tonight, to write down major areas of your life. Lock yourself in a room and say, what do I really believe about this? And truly be honest with yourself. What do I really believe about my future? Where am I heading? If it doesn't line up with this, ladies and gentlemen, it's a bad report. It is of the devil. Bunk it. Junk it. Throw it out. Burn it up. Blow it up. Whatever you have to do, do it quick. <laughs> to believe means to have faith. To be persuaded or have confidence in or trust something or someone. So to trust God is to believe in him. And his promises, and not to believe in him, is to say he's a liar.
what is governing your beliefs today? Is it a local newspaper? Do you wake up in the morning and you can't wait to read the newspaper? Or you turn on the news, bam. Whatever you've given the first early part of your days to is ruling your life to a certain extent. When you wake up in the morning, do you go for a particular TV show? Or you go on the internet? Whatever you are giving your early hours to is ruling your life. And it will continue to rule it. Make it a habit from this day forward. Start your day with this. Don't go for quantity. I love reading through the Bible. It is a great exercise. But I love you to meditate on one scripture. Sometimes spend weeks on it. Because the more you spend weeks on it, the more the life of that word is released. And you are better, you're better off meditating on the just shall live by faith for a whole week. And the Holy Spirit bathing that, just bathing that in your life. Bathing that. Rebathing it in your life. Releasing the power. Releasing the life. Than to read the whole of Romans 1 and say, I don't even remember what I read. So that's what most of us do sometimes. I have to read the Bible today. I have to. Don't do that. Don't make it a chore. Enjoy it. The just shall live by faith. Say it over again. I shall live by faith. Then personalize it. I am living by faith. Amen. You go to work and you say, I am living by faith. Amen. Before you know it, that thing will start releasing life in you. Bondages will be broken naturally. Things will be removed off. Things you, when you change your belief, you will not have to even be asking for people to pray for you. Because it is an immune booster, naturally. It will boost your immune. It will make you richer, make you wiser, make you a more sound decision maker. Because the life of God is released into you and you are aligned with God and the mind of Christ is activated. Why do, you need to, why do you need to live by your belief system? Why? Because, folks, that is the only way you are going to enjoy the manifold grace of God. All the redemption privileges that Jesus Christ purchased for us on the cross of Calvary, all the beating he took, all the humiliation, all the blood he shed, all the healing, all the causes he delivered you from, you will never enjoy one house of it until you start focusing and believing them, indoctrinating them. Amen? Is everyone in here with me? Are you here with me tonight? Yes. I want you to hear this clearly because if you ingest what I'm talking to you, you will never be the same again. Today will be the beginning of the rest of your life. You will open a new chapter and things will change for the better. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's go to Romans 4. Romans 4. And we are going to look at our father of faith. Romans chapter 4. For those, for, for those of you that were here yesterday, you know, I wish we'd be moving on faster than this, but we have to follow his leading. And this is the way he's leading us. We have to make sure we don't want to start a building on the third floor. All right? <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to crash. We want to start it from the foundation and build the first floor and the second floor. Then we can put in the third floor, right? Okay, so that's what we are doing. Romans 4, verse 3. Romans 4, verse 3. For what said the scripture? Abraham believed God. Folks, that's where it began. Abraham believed God. If Abraham didn't believe God, we won't be reading about Abraham tonight. We'll be reading about someone else. Everything in your life, the first rung of the ladder is you believe God. That is where it begins. If you don't believe that, the foundation is totally off. Brother Ken and I, this afternoon, we went out to the tomb of our Lord. And we were there just, you know, just enjoying a beautiful day. Taking picture, talking about what happened, you know. Then as we finished our visit, we were getting ready to leave. There was this young girl. She couldn't be more than maybe 20 years old. 
She was also taking the picture. But she seems like everywhere we went, she was following us. And we were wondering what was going on. So we turned around and we struck, we struck a conversation with her. And we thought maybe she was a tourist. We said where she was from. She said she was from Canada. She said, what do you do? She said, I'm a student. I said, what do you study? She said, psychology. Hmm, I said, psychology. I said, does that present any challenge to line up your psychology with the Bible? She said, Bible? She said, I don't believe the Bible. I said, you mean you went into that tomb right there? You were taking pictures and the flash was going on, pa, 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 like a cameraman. And I said, you don't believe? She said, no. She said, I just believe in historical things. And Brother Ken and I spent the next maybe 20, 30 minutes talking to this girl. But the girl sadly will never believe. She says she sees no need to believe. No need to believe. Sad. 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 But we left her off. We said, you know what, Father? We said, can we say a word of prayer with you? I said, Father, this girl does not know she needs you. But Father, introduce yourself to her. We said over the next 24 to 48 hours, Father, reveal yourself unto her. Yes. And we left on that note. And I know that girl is in for the next, <laughs> is in for a ride. <laughs> I don't know when I'll see her again, but we know. We know. We know she'll be saved in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So yesterday, we talked about Romans chapter 4. Let's go to verse 16. And I want you to listen to the first part of this scripture. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. Listen to that. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. Faith, your belief, precedes grace. You will never enjoy grace without believing and the Bible talks about manifold grace just think about it what did you do when you came to know Yeshua you believed he was the son of God you believed he died for you you believed he took all your sin and your sickness you believed he rose again you've never seen heaven right you've never you didn't see him crucified but you believed something you believed it you activated your belief system and thereby you are saved. And Colossians tells us, just as you receive Christ, walk in him. So that means that's the pattern you are going to follow from that point on. You have to continuously, continuously believe. Believe for your healing. Believe for your children. Believe for your finances. That is the way your salvation, your deliverance, everything is going to happen. It starts believing the right thing. It will never change. That's the pattern. And we found out that Abraham embraced certain belief system before the Lord came to him. Abraham believed he was old and he was getting ready to die. No more hope to live. Sarah, Sarah and Abraham lived a long life. Even though he desired children, but he didn't know how to make it happen. And even God could not unleash the miracle. And this is the thing. Sometimes there is a lot God wants to do in your life. But God is waiting for you to cooperate to change what you believe in. It took a period of time for Abraham to change his belief system before he could have a son. And God used various metaphors and illustrations. Change his name from Abraham to Abraham. Told him to look up in the star, into the sky and look at all the stars. Told him to go to the beach and count all the grain of sand. God was working on his mind. Why? Because as a man thinketh, so is he. As much as God wants to give Abraham a child, that child will not come until Abraham changed the way he thinks. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What you are thinking right now, you are moving closer to it. 
That is why I always encourage people. Ask God to give you a new dream, a new vision for your future. And get some pictures of those dreams. Put it up in your bedroom. Go wild on it. Splash. Paint it with pictures. Rainbow colors. Put it on the refrigerator. Put it across from the toilet. So when you sit there, you're always staring at it. <laughs> Write it down in details. It is worth the exercise. Because the, the moment it registers in your heart, in your spirit, in your subconscious, manifestation has begun. When Abraham believed the right thing, she, he and Sarah conceived and they had a child. Your healing doesn't have to take a long time to manifest, but it is in direct correlation with your belief system. Amen? Amen. 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 Yesterday also we talked about two aspects of our belief system. We talked about most people, they always exercise their belief in one area. And their belief is always driven by need. See, God doesn't want your belief to be driven by need. Learn to plant your garden before you get hungry. So you see someone, maybe they went to a doctor, and the doctor says, oh, I'm sorry, sir. Terminal cancer. You have four months to live. And you see that person, they start running from revival to revival. They go into the scripture, and they start running down all the healing scriptures. They go to the pastor. Maybe this person is only one of those people that visits the church only on Easter and Christmas. Now you start seeing them every Sunday, because that need is driving them. It's driving them. It's driving them. But what did we learn yesterday? You will never be governed by what you believe for a specific need if you have not been committed to being governed by what you believe generally. You will never be governed by what you believe for a specific need if you have not been committed to being governed by what you believe generally. Are you the kind of person that says, well, you know what? I believe the Lord heals, but I don't believe in tithing. See, that's why people have problems. I believe that, you know what? God will bless me, but I don't believe he could bless me in this area. No, 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 no. That is circumventing and short-circuiting your faith. If you believe he's your healer, then believe he's the one that's going to prosper you also financially. Cooperate with the whole, the whole. Don't pick and choose like a Chinese buffet. And you pick this and you pick that and you don't. Eat it all. Take it all in. It's for you. I will read that again. Because someone needs to know that. You will never be governed by what you believe for a specific need if you have not been committed to being governed by what you believe generally. We also learned yesterday, your beliefs are not your prayers, are what affect your circumstances. Does that mean you should not go for prayers anymore? Please, go for prayer. But the prayer will work more wonders and will be quicker in the delivery if it lines up with the belief. In fact, you might not need the prayer if the belief structure is there, built, sound. By the way, all this is recap. The Lord also told us yesterday that actions that are born out of our beliefs have life in them. Actions that are born out of our beliefs have life in them. Actions to curry favor with God or convince ourselves that we are serving God are displeasing to God. So you have a big need, and what do you start to do? Oh, you start reading the Bible. Oh, I'm going to go on a 40-day fast. Oh, I'm going to go to that place and get, the, get this or get that. 
Oh, I'm going to go to church in the morning, afternoon, and night. Why are you doing that? Do you think God doesn't see through that? He sees through it. And he's a merciful God. I'm not saying he will not stretch his hand of mercy towards you. But he also follows the laws of faith. Yet there are certain laws of faith, laws of belief that we have to follow. If we are not following them, it is to our demise. God is a fair judge. Okay? But also, there's, always, there's also a time that he judges. There is a graceful part of God, but there's also there is a consuming fireside. And I pray we don't experience too much of that. But cooperate. Plant your garden before you are hungry. Just imagine, if you wait till you are hungry, and you said, you know what? I'm going to go plant my garden right now. I'm going to go plant tomatoes. I'm going to plant apple. You won't live to eat it. And that's what most believers do. That is what we do. When we get really hungry, we start saying, oh, give me the hoe. Give me the cutlass. I got to cultivate the land. I got to cultivate it. Let me clear out the weed. No. Too late. Right now, today, believe. Believe. Believe the right thing. Deconstruct the whole belief system. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Does everybody have their Bible tonight? Does everybody have their Bible tonight? <laughs> okay. If you don't have your Bible, you might want to sit close. You see, it's, it's good to bring your Bible. That is where your belief code is. Pull it out. Never come to church without your Bible. Always have your Bible. Be familiar with that Bible. Have your highlighter or a pencil or a pen. You want your Bible to look very rugged and old. When I see a, a new Bible, I hope you've just gotten it yesterday. Because if you told me you've had this for five years and it's new, tell me I know something about your belief system right there. Matthew, what did I say? Matthew 7. Okay, Matthew 7. Let me get there myself. And we're going to start from verse 24. Verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him in unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the flood came, and the wind blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand, and the rain descended, and the flood came, and the wind blew, and beat, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Here we see two people, two families. One have a sound belief structure. Jesus says in this life, you will have tribulations. But he said, cheer up, I've overcome the world. I have deprived it of power to harm or hurt you. But that is if you have the right belief system in place. The one man built his house on a rock, the rock of the world. The storm of life came, hit the house from the right, from the north, from the south, from the west and the east. There was a big storm. There was another person here. They built their house, but the belief system was wrong. The storm came also. The wind came from the north and the south and the west and the east. When everything quieted down, one house was totally destroyed. And one was still standing the value of your belief system. That is why sometimes you see some people very successful, maybe a successful couple, 
young and upwardly mobile. Everything is good and everything is fine. They're coming to church every Sunday. Then all of a sudden they stopped coming to church. And you wonder what happened. Then weeks later, or maybe months later, you find out they're divorced, separated. What happened? Oh, we had a little argument on the way to church, and I was just fed up, and we just blah, 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 blah. Before you knew it, marriage, everything, children split, family, boom, gone. And this is happening in the United States. Divorce among the churches in United States is over 50%. Over 50 percent. Over 50 percent. Why? Why? It should not be. And I'm talking about within the church. I'm not talking about in the world. I'm talking about within the church. Why? Sometimes we receive prayer report and you see believers that are sick in the hospital. And I started asking the Lord, Lord, what is happening? Why are People sick in the church as much as they are sick outside of the church. The Lord said they don't know what belongs to them. They do not know. They are ignorant. My people perish. Why? For lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. Wrong belief. That is why what we are talking about tonight is life and death. You make the choice. Now I'm going to shift gears. We're going to go into what I wanted to talk about tonight. 